Oh, sweet hour of prayer. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, we can clap. That's okay. We can do that. <laughs> good morning, St. Matthews. And good morning to those of you at home on Facebook Live or later in the week, whichever you choose. We're so grateful to have all of you here today on this beautiful morning. A little chilly, but lovely. So we're very grateful you're here. We know that this is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's worship. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. The Lord be with you. Let the radiance of Christ be evident among us. In our deepest thoughts and desires. In the hungry and the scared. We join our voices and our hearts in praise. Please join me in the opening prayer. Holy God, who revealed the Messiah on the mountain, fill us with praise, overflowing with cheers and mysterious visions. Light our way, direct our course, and energize us, for we have one more mountain to climb. Through Jesus Christ, who is the light. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, Shine, Jesus, Shine. And in uh, John 1.14, we read, uh, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, uh, the glory of the Father, the only begotten of the Father, uh, full of grace and truth. So here's uh, Shine, Jesus, Shine.
have Jesus in the house, you may sit down. I leaned over to Callie before I go into missions moments, and this is like a weird personal sharing, but the first time I ever heard that song was at a funeral. I am not kidding, and it was a way to truly celebrate God's life in that person and God's life in all of us that are there. So Jesus in the house, we are not having a funeral, which is amen to that, but I'm thankful to be here with you. Y'all, it's been a long time since I have been able to speak to you and share with you the amazing things that are happening with Conejo Connect. And I just wanted to take a moment to update you on some of what is happening, how excited I am to see God working amongst our churches and amongst our youth and this community. Youth group has gone from meeting once a month to twice a month. I know, awesome, huh? And we stay at an average, I'm gonna say eight. My highest has been around 12, not including our adults. My lowest has been four. So eight sounded like a good number to me, but it's been a whole lot of fun. We are exploring a lot of different topics. We actually have youth coming up this week on Friday night, seven o'clock here. And we are, I'm so excited. We are gonna start talking about Lent, but I was telling him I have a craft project that I'm gonna try this week, and if it works, we're gonna do it. We're gonna make window cling labyrinths, and everybody gets to design their own. Pray for me, that's a really good prayer for me to ask you to do, because I've not tried it, but it looks so cool. So I'm gonna try it this week, and if it does, all of our youth kids are gonna have a great time. Um, another thing that's been happening with the life of our youth and children is, I have approached some of our younger, younger ones, and we are going to start a book club. It is gonna be on, I believe, Monday afternoons at four o'clock as of right now. And it is going to be, our first one is The Cold Case Christianity for Kids. It's a mystery, and we get to talk about how we see Jesus and what is going on. And um, I do not have a slide for it, for a really good reason. One of my kids that I've been talking to said, can I make this slide? So as soon as we get the slide and the date that it has started, I will definitely let you all know more. We just finished the Gospel According to Beauty and the Beast, um, the story of transformation. And our last one was transforming love and laying down one's life for another and where we go with that. So that also was a very exciting um, study. We are going into the Lenten study. It is going to be one again on prayer, meditation, and sort of mindfulness. And I'm really, it is here. It starts not this Wednesday, because this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, so join us at Westlake Village, but it will start the following Wednesday, which I believe is March 5th, right around there. I may have a number off a little. Um, but it's going to be a really good study, and um, it is a study that Pastor Jim is going to be helping us lead. So I encourage you all to come out and join us. Um, we have a lot of many fun, many, a lot there, fun activities that we have planned all the way through December. It talks about our camping ministries and everything. So I know a lot of you are like, what is really going on? If you want, I only have five of them that I will definitely go and print more. If you want to see what's actually going on in Conejo Connect and with our youth group. I have one thing I want to share, and I hope I'm not running out of time, so tell me. Okay. Um, it's your sermon. It's my sermon. <laughs> that will go long too. You guys can just like get the hook. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we all as a community experienced the tragic loss of Zach. And I don't share this lightly because it is really uncomfortable for me to tell you like my itty bitty part in it, which was very itty bitty, but it's really important and it really is what Kaneo Connect is all about. Um, the morning of the search party, I was driving the kids to school and I could see the helicopters circling. And I'd been watching on Facebook what was going on and this overwhelming sense of we need to be a presence there. I had a list of stuff I had to do and I was fighting back and forth and finally I called Pastor Jim and I'm like, I need to go buy water and snacks and just sit. And he goes, if that's where the spirit is leading, go. Listen to what the spirit is. Um, so Ty and I went, we bought the water, the snacks. We came out here and we sat right at the corner in front of the labyrinth. The bathrooms were open. And we just sat. 
I didn't advertise that we were there. I didn't offer anything unless they came to us. And I had over a dozen people come by, speak to us, ask us what we knew. Um, but the presence in the community, in the presence talking about what Caneo Connect was, what St. Matthew's was all about, being able to share what an amazing pastor you guys are blessed to have, um, lots of questions with that. And then I also got to be with some people that actually knew the family, who I didn't know knew the family at the time, asked me for news, and I said, it's unconfirmed, there's a body, and she absolutely collapsed in my arms. Um, to pray over her and to be that first line of ministry to her and to others that came was so important. And this is what I truly believe you guys have called me to do as Caneo Connect. It's connecting the three congregations, but then it's getting us out into the community, letting them know our presence, not proselytizing like, you must repent, but that God is here and now. And so you might be asking, what can I do to help in Caneo Connect, in the ministry that they've put amongst all of our churches? And the first thing I can tell you is pray. Pray that hearts are opened, that ears are opened, that the ministry that we're learning, each of us, each and every day, and not really knowing an exact course, even though I have, you know, all of those business plans laid out, God's plans are not always mine, or Pastor Jim's, or Pastor Anna's, or Pastor Walt's, or any of my advisory teams. So sometimes things change, like that Thursday, on a, on a dime, and you just have to be available. So... I pray that each of you continue to pray for us. I ask that each of you consider trying Conejo Connect once. Maybe twice. Maybe it will get in your skin and it's something that adds to what's happening here. Invite your friends. If you know that your neighbors are maybe searching or looking but they don't really, they've been harmed by the traditional church, say, hey, Come speak to Pastor Christy. She's got something new going on. Come see what this new Caneo Connect is all about. Come speak to Pastor Jim or anybody that is around that knows. I know there's quite a few that have attended. Let's see what this is about because those personal connections are what are going to help us to grow and meet the mission that God has called us to do. So I thank you for your time. And now it's children's time. So... I have a few who volunteered because I asked them to. Come on up here, if you would, and, and sit with me up here. In fact, maybe you guys could sit on the steps. That would be easier, wouldn't it? That way they can see you anyway. And somebody, without even prompting, wore their Marvel sweatshirt today. Nice job. So I asked my three grandsons who are now, I don't know, they're under 11. 11, 9, and 7. Am I close? Eight, whatever. They're, they're right there. Okay. And I asked them if they, could meet, if they could meet any hero that they wanted to and that would magically happen, who would they meet and what would they ask them? So my grandson uh, Noah, he said, oh, yeah, Superman. He's my favorite. And, and I said, well, what would you ask him? And he thought, what would I ask Superman? He said, well, I'd ask him, is he ever afraid of something? Because, you know, sometimes superheroes seem like they're, they're so far out there that it's impossible for us to do anything like they do. But my other uh, grandson, who's the eight-year-old, he said, uh, Batman, of course. Like, Grandpa, don't you know? It's Batman, right? And uh, I said, okay, well, what would you ask him? And he said, I don't know what I would ask him. What do you ask a superhero? You know, like that. And his mom chimes in and says, how do you get your suit on so fast? <laughs> yeah. Can I have the keys to the battle? Can I have the keys to the battle? That'd be good. So do you have a superhero that you kind of like? You, yeah, who? You don't know? You don't know? Do you have one? Anybody have one that they kind of... Well, how about just a hero in general? Anybody, if you could meet anybody in the world that has ever lived or who, you know, is maybe their fantasy, but would you ever, who would you like to be? You're going to leave it all to me to tell you? No. Come on. Do you have one? Do you guys have one? No? All right. Well, my oldest son, he said, uh, uh, he, he knew I was asking and I'm a preacher, so he said, Jesus. <laughs> 
I said, oh, that's too easy. So I have a superhero, and his name is John Wesley. And I thought, if I was going to put on a cape, because apparently superheroes have capes, you know? I don't know why, because they get in the way. Um, I, I used to think that when, when I would watch this old television show about Batman and Robin, and every time they hit anybody, it would go poof and boom. And you remember these? Right? And I thought, how can you swing your arm around without getting it caught in that cape thing, you know? So anyway, I was thinking John Wesley is one of my heroes because he was living in England so many years ago, and there was this problem they had where people, well, there, were, there was a lot of uh, hungry people, there was a lot of famine, there was a lot of disease going on, and there was a lot of this new thing called scotch that was being made. And unfortunately, the whole, the whole nation was drowning in scotch. Um, it was a gift from the other part of the British Isles that got to London, and it was so prevalent that the bars were full, but the churches were half empty. So John and Charles and his brothers, they decided they were going to go into the bars and they were going to talk to people. So Charles was a piano player. And the piano player in bars would just be playing away, kind of like you see in the old westerns. And there's the one guy at the piano always playing, good or bad, right or wrong. Um, they're not nearly as gifted as Kevin is. And, uh, and Charles would come over and say, hey, Kevin, can I, can I sit at the piano and play uh, a little while while you take a break? And the piano player would go, sure, of course, I'll back off of here. Although I don't know if you get up your piano. But he would sit down and play these hymns that he wrote. And people would go, what in the world is that music? And the second they did that, then John would get up on a chair or on the bar or someplace. And he didn't always have a robe on. But the reason he wore these robes and the reason we've been using these as pastors all these years is because it's supposed to get rid of all of the things that people worry about when you stand in front of them. Like what kind of clothes you wear. Do you ever, ever have people kind of judge you about your clothes? Uh, no? Out loud, they never say anything to you. You judge yourself. I bet most of the people in this room get up and put on clothes and judge themselves based on their clothes. But robes were supposed to get rid of all that. And the reason that I love wearing a robe is because it represents God and not me. So the idea of a robe is to get rid of that. Like a cape says, oh, superhero. But the superhero that John Wesley was is that he believed that God was more important than anything in the world. In fact, everything in the world. And he himself had a problem once in a while with having too much of that scotch that would help him forget <laughs> stuff. Um, he, was, uh, he was imperfect. He... Uh, he didn't get married for a long time. When he finally got married, the first one didn't work out. The second one was his nurse who was caring for him when he was sick, and he fell in love with her, and they got married. So John had like three partners in his life. He, he didn't always have everything put together. He came from a family of 18 children. Oh, wow. That's what <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But his mother, who gave birth to all of those children and taught all of them about the Bible, um, and only 15 of them survived. There were three that didn't make it to late in life. But, but John, John was a person who believed that God was more important than anything and everything. And that's why he's kind of my superhero. And I, I robe up not thinking like I'm throwing a cape on, I'm going to put a mask on, but I'm thinking that if I was going to want to talk to somebody, I would love to sit down with him and say, with as hard a life as you had, why did you keep talking about God's love, grace, un unmerited love of God? And, you know, to hear a little bit about his story. So what happens when we meet our heroes? It's kind of hard. But Jesus himself had heroes. And today we're going to hear about two of those heroes that show up. Moses, who never made it across the river until that day when he was with Jesus on the top of that mountain. He died on the other side of the river because he wasn't faithful to God in one place. And I thought, that's kind of unfair, dying on this side of the Jordan just because you didn't strike a rock on that one day. I mean, look at all this good stuff he did, good things he did. And then 
Um, the other was Elijah, who had to show up, this greatest of the prophets. He had to show up in order for the prophecies to be filled. So this is what we're going to hear about today in the Transfiguration, is Jesus and his heroes and a conversation that we don't know what was said, but I'm pretty sure Jesus was a little freaked out that he was standing there with these two people. And, uh, you know, what a great day that was. All right, let's pray. God, we may not have superheroes in our life that make much of a difference, but in truth, you love us so much and you've gifted us with so much that we can be a hero to somebody else. We can be faithful. We can be strong in our beliefs and we can act the way you would want us to so others would follow. Make us truly your children and your servants. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. scripture this morning is from Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. Uh, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about this vision uh, until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So it's been quite a week. You were down. Now you're up. <laughs> we're glad. And Heidi uh, was supposed to be here to sing this morning, and she got down last night. I guess got sick and so anyway with uh, about 10 minutes of thought we thought oh what are we going to do for an anthem today so here it is <laughs> Ah uh -huh. 
Let us pray. Holy God, you've called us all here for this time, this place. Open the hearts of those that hear the words that you've placed in my heart, in my mouth. Let it be holy and pleasing unto you. O oh Lord, you are my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Sorry, get a big smile because I see my baby back there. <laughs> so here you guys are out walking with a group of buddies. Picture it. You make it to the top of a beautiful mountain and suddenly one of your friends changes before your very eyes. His face shines as bright as the sun. His robes, his clothes become a brilliant, bright light. White. Oh, but that's not all. You recognize the law and the prophets. They've arrived and they're talking to your friend. And you offer to leave because obviously this is really important and maybe you shouldn't be there. But before you can finish your sentence, a bright cloud overshadows the law, the prophets. And the word, and a voice from heaven speaks. My preaching professor, Alice McKenzie, once said that it is fun to identify with the characters of stories. Whether it's in a novel that you have beside your bed that you can't wait to get home to read, or the characters in a favorite movie, TV show, play, whether it is any of those things, we find that we identify with a character or a situation in that story. It's not something that we do consciously, but Dr. McKenzie explained it works something like this. You have some quality that I also have. You are like me in some way. Or... You have some quality that I don't have. Show me how to be like you. Identifying with characters are the fun of the stories. That is why we crave stories. We need them. It is through relating with the characters that we figure out who we are and where we are going. But what happens when we do not identify with a character? Have you ever turned off a TV show, walked out of a play or a movie, and slammed a book shut forever? I know in our family, if it doesn't grab us within 15 minutes, we're done. 
Well, okay, true confessions. Jeff and I walked out of being John Makovich in way less time than that and never looked back. <laughs> now we find ourselves hearing this transfiguration story, not for the first time in our lives, or maybe it is the first time we've heard it, or maybe this is the first time we've actually paid attention. This is a story with six characters, but not necessarily any character we can identify with. We've got dazzling Jesus, son of God. I don't know about you, but Jesus is a character that I don't think I could be presumptuous enough to identify with. We have Moses, who spoke to God face to face. And we have Elijah, who never died, but went up to heaven in a chariot of fire, drawn by flaming horses? Then there's the disciples. I don't know about you, but they're a little too human for my liking. I could never identify with them. Well, maybe not. One can hope. If this was put on the big screen, would I be willing to sit through it? Would I relate to it enough or relate to something on a deeper level that would keep me involved till the end? So Thursday night, I was able to see Callie's play for the first time. After the first act, I have to tell you, I was very uneasy. And I wasn't sure how I was going to make it to the end. True confession. But I'm so glad that I hung in there. There was a message that was identifiable to this time that we are living in here and now. Here's the cool thing, though. It was six one acts. And there was a character that somebody could identify throughout each of these six one acts. There was some characteristic, some personality that you could say, hey, I recognize what you're saying. And through those meanings, you were able to see how they viewed their part of the world and would hopefully go forward to make a difference. The instructor, her, her drama teacher, came to the front and said, hopefully you are empowered to go forth and make a difference in this world after you view these one acts. And I have to tell you, I came out with that feeling pretty good. Like, I get this. I can do this. As long as my eyes don't fall to the floor, we're good. Okay, inside joke, sorry. If we circle back to the characters in our transfiguration story, we might be able to find out that we have more in common with them than we originally thought. Let's look at Jesus. Jesus was both divine and human. And through his humanness, through his teaching, through the things that he had been doing, he was tired. He invited three of his disciples to go up to a mountaintop and perhaps rest. You know, I don't know that he knew that there was a plan for a meetup up there or not, but he needed to get away from the crowds. And yet, he got up there, and guess what? Company's coming. And then he could look down, and he had the people at the bottom of the mountain saying, Where is I need? Can you help? So he's in this dichotomy. I think we can all relate to that bone-weary tiredness, that need to refresh, especially when you are active in the ministry of the church, in the community, in your home, where somebody is constantly coming at you. Then we have Moses. And through all of his greatness, we must remember that he really didn't want to be a prophet anyway. Remember all those excuses he was giving? We would never give excuses to God, would we? 
And then Elijah. Well, his humanness had him running for the hills when Queen Jezebel's army tried to kill him. Hmm. I don't think any of us have ever run from God, have we? Oh, and then there's the disciples. Well, I am pretty sure that we are more like them than any of us would care to admit. James and John, the sons of thunder. And they're probably standing up there, staring at the whole scene with their slack jaws, hanging free in awe. This story is as much our story as it is theirs. We are called to recognize the transfigured Christ. And, and this is a big end, transform ourselves to people of light in a world that feels just a little bit too dark sometimes. The transformation and revitalization is happening all around us, friends. We are part of an amazing spiritual awakening. I want to tell you another story. This story is true also, and it is happening here and now. We are in the middle of it, and we don't know the exact outcome. So how many of you have heard about the Asbury revival going on in Kentucky? On February 8th, 2023, at Asbury University, there was a spontaneous revival that broke out. It started in the morning after their morning prayer, and I've heard a few people that have said that it started because they stayed behind to pray. I've heard others say that there was a gospel um, group that had come in and they stayed to listen to them. But whatever happened, the spirit started to flow. And it flew among them. It infiltrated them. It's not a revival, and I will talk a little more about that in a minute, but it's not a revival that we hear that would be like a Billy Graham out in the middle of a thousand million people, loud um, praise bands playing that are professional and known and these big speakers. This is more of a quiet revival that's going on. This morning, if my count is right, it's day 12, 24 hours continuous since February 8th. People are traveling from all over to spend time in the presence of God. But this is the exciting part that I really want to share with you. Guys, this is led by Generation Z. Gen Z is at the base of all of this. It is students that are coming in and speaking or saying prayers or leading very quiet music with guitar or with piano. Very simple. They are not bringing in big name speakers. In fact, Another rumor I heard is one of the big name speakers came and wanted to be there and they were turned away at the door. It is a quiet, cont contemplative time. So in some of the venues or the places that I've been reading about this, people were sharing their experience and I wanted to share these with you. We just left Asbury a few hours ago and this was probably the most transformative day of my life. I've never experienced anything like this, and I'm still trying to process what happened today. All I know is that it was life-giving and life-changing. I'm so thankful for the chance to go and witness this incredible move of God. I don't know how many people were there today, but I would say there was at least 10,000. It was an awe-inspiring day. This is such a small window of time for me to adjust, to seek God and then move out. But I can promise you that my life has been radically interrupted and altered by the Holy Spirit that will result in new directions and callings. It's only been about 18 hours since I have left Wilmore, and I'm still getting my bearings. But friends, as we hear these positive things going on, there's also the negative. Those that are questioning, is this real? Is this a farce? Are they putting something on? Are they? You can hear that negativity, that negative energy running everywhere. So in one of the clergy groups, somebody put that up. Is this real? How do we know it's real? What's going on? 
And this was the answer. A good question. I went last Thursday, and as I sat, I asked God to show me the truth. He showed me his presence and shared a few things. So I left because it was getting dark, and I didn't want to walk in the dark to my car. But since then, I still feel like I'm there. His presence came with me. I haven't wanted anything but him. The rest and peace is still over me. He's changed things in me that I can't describe. Well, maybe later. This is not a head thing. It's a heart thing. Closer and closer. And last, I'm filled with the hope and joy. So I say go and see for yourself. Another one of my professors, Fred Schmidt, wrote a post on exactly what is happening and what is meant by revival. Much of the negative commentary on the revival at Asbury University is a wide mark because it mistrusts the conviction that God can intervene in people's lives. It can be seen as nothing but manipulation. And as the engine of such behavior, and to the extent that it understands the theological assumptions behind such movements, it relies on the reformed and fundamentalist notions of revival. But revival in the Wesleyan context is very different, both in terms of its history and its theological assumptions. At the best, it presupposes the possibility of perfection in love, love of God and by virtue of that love, a love of others. It represents the Methodist appropriation of the orthodox notion of the theosis, and envisions the possibility of personal transformation, theosis, study of God. Unlike the Reformed tradition, it looks beyond the experienced and saving grace to the larger vision made possible by God's sanctifying grace. These are not two separate things, but a larger vision of what God longs to give us. Don't take her. We love hearing the sound. Don't worry. It's all good. That experience does not stop with the individual, however. It holds that we are blessed to be a blessing. And that is why the university and the seminary, seminary in Wilmore have been true to the engine of ministry and mission, care for the poor and the marginalized, and a vision that has embraced John Wesley's vision of the world as his parish. Again, that was Dr. Fred Schmidt, just kind of wrapping up what's happening there. But friends, from the transformation, from the transfiguration, say that three times fast, until now, God's presence is alive in among us. And all that we do, there's a light in the darkness that we sometimes feel surrounded in. I have read that it is spreading from that chapel, that campus, out to others, and I've also seen reports that it's going to other states. God's spirit is alive and moving. And again, most importantly, it's a Gen Z-led movement. And I want to focus on that because that is what Caneo Connect, that is what our hopes are all about, to reach the younger generation, let them experience the power and saving grace of God. When we say that the kids and young adults are our future, I hope that you look deeper into what's happening at Asbury. We have our own transformation and revitalization right here, right now in the Conejo Valley. God is working through so many St. Matthew's UMC, the UMCs of Thousand Oaks, and New Bear, uh, Westlake Village, and many other churches in our community. It's not just a Methodist thing. We are standing in the darkness to share God's light to the world. And we may not always see those changes right away. Some in Kentucky may experience the spiritual and emotional high, the presence of God, clearly. yet they may not know what it means for their future. There may be others that are watching and waiting outside for what is to come, questioning if this is God. Is this worth it? Is this just an act for attention? But I am sure the people standing at the base of the mountain 
had to see some strange bright light, wondering, what is happening? Yet, maybe not yet in a place to understand. As we follow God's promptings, what character will we relate to? Will we be on the mountaintop participating in part of the transfiguration, understanding who Jesus is and is to come? Will we be those at the base of the mountain waiting to hear our marching orders because we've noticed that light, we've noticed the difference in our atmosphere around us? Or will we be those in the shadows, questioning and maybe turning away? Revival at Asbury, revitalization of our Christian faith and the meaning of the spirit, transformation of our lives and light. To walk into a world sharing Christ's love and light to all we meet. Maybe we can relate on a personal level to each of the players in our transfiguration saga after all. May Christ perpetual light shine upon us as we walk revitalized into the world transformed by the transfiguration. Let us pray. Mighty God, there is a revival going on maybe not organized, maybe not 24 hours a day, but amongst us now. Your Holy Spirit is here and now and follows us wherever we go. May we be connected to your spirit and to the light of Christ that we continue to be a light for this world. We ask this now in the name of the creator, the sustainer, and the redeemer. Shalom and amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today grateful for this beautiful day that we have. We know there are places in the world where uh, the weather is not so great and that people are uh, recovering from natural disasters, and we do ask that you be with them. We come with new requests, Father, Dennis in hospice care. And also in hospice care, our former president, Jimmy Carter. We pray, Father, for the family of the Newbury Park woman who was killed just this last weekend. And we continue to pray, Father, for all of those in Michigan, Michigan State University, and all of the area that is mourning the death of those students. Father, please let your light come into the world and rid the world of hate and let love shine forth. We pray with our brothers and sisters at the Knollwood United Methodist Church and Grace Korean United Methodist Church. And Father, we pray for those who are in mourning. Our sister Wendy, and her family on the passing of her mother. <clears throat> Sister-in-law Cheryl and family on the passing of Christie's older brother. Family of Mark Truman, the family of Paul Rubel, the family of Zachary, and the family of Rita Buckley. And we know, Father, there are others who are hurting. We ask that you wrap them in your loving arms and just let them know that you are there. Help us to wrap our arms around them also, in thought, in word, and in deed. We pray for many who are on our list for health and recovery. Some have just been diagnosed with a disease. Some have, are recovering from surgery. We ask that you be with them and with their care takers, and with the doctors and nurses who attend them. 
and for those in cancer treatment. It seems that our list gets longer and longer and longer. Help the scientists develop some kind of treatment for these horrible diseases, and not just cancer, but all of the diseases around the world that are spreading. Let the scientists find ways to either cure them or treat them, and find the causes so that perhaps we may eradicate them. We pray for our elected leaders, that they will make wise choices, and that you will be with them and guide them. All this, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we ask that you think about the many blessings that we have received. Father, we lift these, our tithes and our offerings to you. May the hands that distribute them be done in your name. Amen. Amen. And I believe it is time for the closing hymn. Yeah, closing hymn. <laughs> holy, 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 holy Lord, <laughs> God Almighty. Uh, yeah, just to imagine that someday we'll actually be able to behold the actual fullness and the glory of his infinite, you know, and 
that, that his holiness. Um, but we've had glimpses, and in Colossians 2.9, uh, we read that uh, in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So uh, we had had glimpses, but, but someday, uh, yeah, we have a lot to wor- look forward to uh, with the infinite glory of, of the Creator. So here's holy, holy, holy. light has fallen on each of us. Now we choose whether we are going to go forth into the world shining that light of God or if we're going to close our eyes and not share with others. So my challenge to you this week is be that light to another. It could be a smile, a handshake, a hug, or just a kind word, but be the light of Christ to the world. In the name of the Holy Holy One. Amen. Well, I don't see Julianne here, so I guess it's me. (laughs) Um, The life of the church continues to go out into the community. We have many, many opportunities coming up. Linda, would you like to share a little bit about Journey Out? I want to say thank you to those of you who have already brought items that are going to go. We're hoping to take them sometime this week down to Van Nuys to the organization Journey Out, which helps women who have been sexually exploited or trafficked. And so the donations of socks and leggings and shoes and body wash and shampoo, we've already got at least two boxes overflowing and there's more I see out there today. So if for some reason you might have forgotten your donation, um, we also are taking uh, cash, check, <laughs> and gift cards, or if you need to let, get something to me this week, just let me know. Thank you so much for considering helping out with this and sharing your agape love. Thank you, Linda. We have all heard a joyful noise in our congregation today, and you have to turn around and see this precious little one in the back, and look at the little top knot on her head. <laughs> oh, she is just precious. Thank you for bringing her. She, she brings smiles to our faces, doesn't she? Isn't it nice to smile? So. We have a lot going on. We have a progressive dinner on the 18th of March. Uh, What you see is what I know. 
<laughs> so anyway, I'm sure there will be things coming out, but do watch because um, it was several years ago that we had one and it was a lot of fun and brought us all together wonderfully. The quilting ministry is meeting on Wednesdays. The Caneo Connect we have heard a great deal about today and unless you're in our church choir, you should be at Caneo Connect. <laughs> We are always looking for recruits for uh, Caneo Connect and for our church choir. <laughs> Shrove Troop Tuesday, pancake dinner, and uh, Wednesday of this week, this week is Ash Wednesday, and there will be services at uh, the Westlake Village UMC, and we are all invited to partake in that. Uh, at the beginning of Lent. The beautiful altar flowers this morning in memory of Norma Rich and of Jeffrey Lynn Rich. And thank you, all of you who have uh, gotten our fellowship together. I'm sure they're always uh, looking for... <laughs> okay then, I guess we're done. <laughs> I mean, to put a smile on her face, whatever it was. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're grateful for all of you, and please continue to serve our church, to serve our community, and to bring that light of Christ into the world around us. Birthdays. Ho, ho, ho. Miss Louise. Jen Quo, Patty Berry, and Max Young. Let's sing happy birthday. Welcome home, St. Matthews. Have a wonderful week.